bringing you the latest in tax credit news, this is Tax Credit Tuesday with your host, Michael Novogratik. Hello, I'm Michael Novogratik, and this is Tax Credit Tuesday. This is the January 24th, 2023 podcast. In today's episode, we're going to discuss how public housing authorities can better protect against fraud. Now, while today's topic has a focus on public housing authorities, our tips are also useful to others who are working in affordable housing, community development, and real estate development more generally. If you're wondering what inspired us to talk about this issue on this podcast, the idea actually came from a listener who heard our Tax for Tuesday podcast episode back in October about post rental assistance administration hot topics. The listener requested that my guest on that episode, partner Rich Larson, give a presentation on helping public housing authorities, PHAs, protect their assets. Now, Rich is back on the podcast today to share his insights on that topic. Rich also wrote an article for the January issue of the Novograd Journal of Tax Credits about safeguarding PHA assets. His tips come from more than 30 years of experience with public housing authorities and developer clients as an accountant, auditor, and consultant. So if you're a PHA, a developer or property manager, today's episode is designed to help you identify potential risk areas for fraud and learn how to better protect your assets. Now, of course, this is the disclaimer, there's no guarantee against all fraud, but there are smart controls you can implement to minimize the opportunity for fraud. And if fraud does occur, you wanna be sure to have a system in place to help you identify and address those issues as soon as possible. We do have a lot to talk about today, so if you're ready, let's get started. Rich, welcome back to Task Road Tuesday. Thanks, Mike. It is great to be back. Uh, it's super having you back, and it's uh, interesting that you, that a employee of a public housing authority reached out to you after the podcast last year for this topic, so I'm looking forward to discussing it with you. Yeah, we had a great conversation, had some great feedback, some great questions, so uh I think we're gonna have a good session here. So before we dive into the specific areas of risk and how public housing authorities can better protect their assets in each of these areas, I wanna take a step back and talk about why the topic of fraud prevention is particularly timely now, because it's something that at first blush, you wouldn't think it'd be particularly timely, right. but as we discussed in preparing for the podcast, there are a number of reasons why now is a particular time to be focused on fraud prevention. All right. So as an order, Mike, of uh, public housing authorities, um, I've seen that many PHAs modified certain internal control procedures to accommodate for employees working from home during the pandemic. Um, while many of these modifications may have been necessary given the circumstances, PHAs really need to get back to proper internal controls in order to safeguard PHA assets. Um, We've also seen PHAs that have had RAD projects on hold for the last 18 months. Now they're fast-tracked to get these projects completed. You know, as a result, um, we see PHAs spending millions of dollars on multiple projects in a very short period of time, which can leave them very vulnerable to fraud and abuse. Um, and, and, and finally, uh, Something we know, PHAs received hundreds of thousands and in some cases millions of dollars in CARES Act funding, uh, which required them to obligate these funds quickly in order for the PHA to continue to provide essential services during the pandemic. Um, you know, for example, many PHAs purchased very expensive equipment to upgrade their technology. Well, most PHAs do not have a structure in place to safeguard very expensive portable equipment like iPhones and laptops as they never had to provide for these items before. So those three topics really um, have brought this conversation to light. Thank you for that, Rich. You've named a lot of important factors that have coalesced over the past three years. You noted that the pandemic caused a lot of people to work remotely. And because of that, public housing authorities needed to have new equipment and change many of the protocols. You also mentioned an influx of pandemic relief funds that needed to be spent within a short period of time. And on top of that, you also mentioned that many RAD projects were put on hold or at least slowed down uh, to a nail scroll, and they're now in a tight time frame completed. 
So these are the factors that help really help set the stage. We're talking about why many public housing authorities are at this, you know, inflection point where they should be re-examining their processes and identifying their areas of risk. So broadly speaking, what would you say are the main risk areas for fraud public housing authorities should be focused on monitoring? You know, Mike, my, my opinion um, is that there are, are probably four main areas of concern for PHAs when it comes to fraud. Um, one would be rent collection, uh, building materials and related expenses, as we mentioned, the, the, the RAD process, um, safeguarding physical assets, uh, and of course, cyber fraud, which is becoming a, a, a huge problem uh, in society. Yeah, that cyber fraud certainly is. So, you know, just to uh, uh, recap, he said rig collections, collection. building materials, the physical assets of the housing authority, as well as digital assets, you know, that are at risk of, or it could be lost through cyber fraud. So how would you rank those four in order of how commonly you see issues with respect to each of those categories? Other. Great question, Mike. Uh, you know, given the high volume of transactions and the decentralization of certain assets, fraud regarding rent collection and the theft of physical assets are the most common fraud, you know, that I see in PHAs today. Um, however, if you're looking at what is PHA's greatest exposure in terms of dollar value, cyber fraud and fraud regarding uh, building materials could easily have the largest impact on a PHA, as one instance of fraud alone could result in losses in the tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, tens of thousands or much more. Yes, yes, uh, yes absolutely. Uh, whereas the, uh, it seems like the first two, the rig collections and physical assets, you know, or have a few, have less zeros, that's uh, right. For yeah, broad event right. potentially than the cyber fraud and building materials. So let's uh, unpack those four. I always like to go through each of these areas uh, and, and discuss each one sort of uniquely. So let's start with rent sure. collection. What are the types of controls that public housing authorities uh, can be enacting to better protect against fraud with respect to rent uh, collection? And let me also note, as we said in the intro, this isn't just for public housing authorities, it also applies to that's uh, right. any entity that's collecting rent. And obviously we do a lot of work with long overseas task for developers, so it would apply to them as well and their property managers. That's right. Uh, and, and as you know, Mike, you know, rent collection is generally decentralized. You know, that is each development usually will have a central location whereby tenants, you know, pay or drop off their, their rent. Uh, you know, once rent is collected by a property manager, controls need to be in place to make sure that those funds are properly posted to the tenant's account and deposited with the PHA. Um, accordingly, the duties of rent collection and posting uh, should be segregated to prevent the potential for someone to misappropriate a rent payment, yet still record the rent payment as received by the PHA. Um, you know, and that really, I think during the pandemic was the biggest uh, control, I think that was uh, overlooked by housing authorities because, uh, you know, all these people were working on their own. And I think, you know, that control really was overridden and, and really shouldn't have been. And so as auditors, that's something that we're looking at when we're, we're um, you know, performing our annual audits. Uh, but more importantly, this type of fraud can be prevented through a few simple controls. Uh, property managers that receive rent payments should never be able to adjust individual tenant accounts. Um, they should only be able to record receipt of the payment through daily batch processing uh, and only have access to tenants' accounts for query purposes. You know, that is account query enables the property manager to provide tenants with details concerning account rent, or outstanding rent and late charges, but it, most importantly, it does not allow the property manager to make changes to the tenant account. Uh, also, the PHA's accounting system must be able to provide a computer-generated receipt for the tenant. You know, in fact, 
I think PHA should display a sign uh, or notification stating that tenants who do not receive a receipt should contact the PHA's finance department immediately. Um, copies of deposit slips and checks received by the property manager should be provided daily to the finance department for recording and reconciliation of daily receipts. Um, and finally, Mike, uh, tenant statements should be mailed or emailed at least monthly by the finance department. That enables tenants to know if they are delinquent or what happened to the payment that they made last week, for instance. Um, you know, and most importantly, these procedures will not cost the PHA any more money, but undoubtedly, I think will result in more secure tenant collections. It seems like the various suggests that you may are all about segregation of duties and making sure that the tenant knows what the public housing authority thinks they receive uh, in terms of payments for the tenant. And That's they, right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like confirming them, the, you know, the monthly statements. So what other steps do you think public housing authorities could take beyond the segregation of duties in this kind of indirect competition approach? Can they do to monitor rent payments? Sure. You know, because, because of the pandemic, um, and PHA is working from home, we've seen tenant AR amounts at their highest level that I can remember, and it has really negatively impacted a PHA's finances. I mean, uh, listen, understandably during the pandemic, we can see how that happened. Um, however, in order to get those balances back down, finance departments need to hold property managers, property managers accountable for collection efforts. Um, you know, we're recommending monthly meetings with property managers to review outstanding tenant AR reports. Um, you know, amounts not getting collected need to be investigated. Tenants need to be contacted and if necessary, put on a repayment agreement or ultimately turned over to the PHA attorney for eviction. No, definitely when you mentioned the high tenant AR, that's definitely something that yeah. good news is it's been coming down, uh, it, it has. but it, it takes effort. Uh, and focused effort to bring the AR down. That's correct. So let's turn to the number two item on your list, and that was building materials and expenses. And this is one of the two that you mentioned, along with sort of cyber fraud or digital asset risk that have the, it may not, you know, occur as often or as it may not be as likely to occur, but when it does, it can be notably larger dollar amounts. So what are some of the fraud risk issues that you see with respect to billing with drills and expenses? Sure. Well, I, as you know, Mike, it's something we, we've talked about a lot on, on podcasts. Uh, PHAs have been repositioning their public housing stock. And, and whether it's through RAD or Section 18, these options usually require the PHA to rehab their properties, which could result in the purchase of several hundred thousand dollars of materials such as lumber, appliances, fixtures, and, and other items. Um, PHAs need to have controls in place to avoid theft of property through individuals over-ordering materials and also controls over the delivery or receipt of such materials. Uh, you know, one solution um, that we talk about all the time is to hire an independent construction manager to review and sign off on all purchase orders and maintain strict budget controls. Um, you know, any variances from budget need to be reviewed and approved prior to ordering of materials. Um, you know, additionally, uh, I mean, this may sound very, very elementary or and simple, but all construction deliveries need to be made only to the PHA site during normal business hours. Materials that are delivered should be reviewed and approved by an on-site supervisor. Well, thank you for those tips. And is there, you know, additional ways that public housing authorities, in addition to what you've shared so far, can be tracking building materials in extremities? Yeah. Um, you know, for construction contracts, we recommend a three-part PO system that really works the best. Uh, you know, one part of the PA goes to the vendor 
one part stays with the construction manager when he signs off on it, and one part goes to finance. The PAO that goes to finance um, should be input into a job cost system and tracked in real time against approved budgets. Budget to actual variances need to be investigated immediately. Mike, it is my experience that is a lot easier to recover funds from errors or irregularities when the job is in progress uh, as opposed to several months after completion. So you said a three-part PO system for construction contracts. So why don't you explain to our listeners what the letters PO stand for? Oh, uh, what point sure. For us? <laughs> sure. I, uh, a PO system PO stands for... Is <laughs> right, a purchase order system. So in essence, when the construction budget is set up, uh, all the purchase orders will be generated based on the budget of that job. And so the construction manager gets the POs, and when the work is completed, he signs off on the PO, gives one copy to the vendor who provided the service or the materials, one goes to finance, and he keeps one. And uh, the most important aspect of that is that finance now in real time, you know, has that cost and can track that cost and any variance, well, there, there should not be variances because, you know, we always like to have those POs pre-printed and with, with the amount, the vendor and the amount of the approved budget for that line item. So thank you for that. Um, it seems, and that all is going to happen at the very beginning, and then you're going to be measuring against what's actually happening along the way. And as you point out, uh, investigate variances. And I presume if you have change orders for the construction contract, then you would expect there to be new purchase orders put in place. Absolutely. That's a, that's a, that's a great point, Mike. Yes. Any change order would generate a new purchase order and. And to get that approved purchase order out, you'd have the proper approvals. That's, that's a great point. So let's turn now to number three on your list, and that's physical assets, something that is, has a higher propensity uh, or higher risk for fraud, but the dollar numbers, you know, aren't nearly as significant. Uh, and as part of that, I think it's worth reminding listeners what you mentioned earlier. Uh, that the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act of 2020, uh, along with the Coronavirus Response and Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, uh, CRCA, uh, both of those bills provided much needed economic assistance to public housing authorities. And they also allowed for a wide range of expenditures to help housing authorities navigate the negative effects of COVID-19. And I think as you intimated or hinted at, many public housing authorities use that money to upgrade their technology so that employees work remotely, so they can work at home. Um, and, you know, many of our public housing authority clients have hundreds yeah. of employees. And with a workforce of that size, you know, many of which are working at home, uh, you had a lot more smartphones getting purchased, laptop computers, printers, and other, you know, expensive technology that was being provided to employees during COVID. What are some of the uh, ways in which housing authorities can ensure that, that, that there isn't very much leakage <laughs> where there's some right. assets? Uh, well, Mike. With physical assets, with these type of uh, technology assets, uh, you know, high ticket items, um, very portable equipment, uh, we really think it's important to have someone outside the IT department and the purchasing department to monitor and maintain accounting control over equipment. Uh, we recommend that all equipment over a certain dollar threshold is tagged and inventory. Uh, information kept on file should include the name of the responsible person, uh, which has control over that asset, as well as you can have any other useful business information, such as warranty info and data purchase and things like that. Um, but the most important thing is to have uh, accountability for the person who has control over that asset. And so we'll recommend that 
periodic surprise checks or, or counts of equipment um, occur. And that can happen simply by just requiring the responsible person to, to bring in that laptop or to bring in the iPhone to the central office um, where that equipment will be inspected, verified that it's still in use, and then return back to the employee um, for his use. But it sends a signal that we're, we're keeping control of these assets and that a $1,000 laptop uh, is not going to go unaccounted for and it's not going to disappear or an iPhone is not going to be given to someone's child to use and, and so forth. And, and once again, similar to, you know, the first issue or item that we talked about with respect to rent collections, uh, the controls here rely heavily on segregation of duties. Yes. Uh, in terms of breaking it away from that, just the IT and purchasing departments having an, another uh, department involved. Um, that's important. And then also the, you know, creating the documentation, just like with, uh, you know, materials, with materials, having the PO in the, in a different, uh, you know, having three parts to it. So three different groups are involved. They're doing the same thing here in terms of having a tracking system in place with multiple parties involved as part of that tracking system. That's right. To increase the chance that if something's missing, it will be identified as missing. That's right. And, and, you know, we've seen in the past that IT departments had control over this whole process. So I, I, I remember, you know, doing an audit not too long ago, um, and there were boxes of laptops and of electronic equipment sitting in a room and really not a lot of control over it. And it, you know, it was probably a hundred thousand dollars worth of material sitting right there. And so you really need to have control over that. Um, or you just lose that over time. So let's turn now to the fourth and final item on your list. And that has to do with digital assets or cyber fraud. And this is certainly the one that scares me the most. Uh, in terms of how significant the uh, cost can be, you know, we talked about hardware, um, but this cyber fraud's more about the software running on those vice on those devices, or in some cases, software that wasn't intended to be run on those devices that managed to be uh, gotten onto those devices. Uh, maybe you could discuss how cyber fraud has affected public housing authorities, uh, more importantly, as well as the vulnerable populations that public housing authorities serve. Now, just once again, emphasize again, we're talking about cyber fraud here. This is something that right. is across public housing authorities. Any type of business has to be hypersensitive to cyber fraud. Right. E exactly, Mike. And, and it's not only becoming a serious problem, not only with PHAs, uh, which HUD has taken notice of, but society as a whole. It's um, you know, I have seen PHAs lose tens of thousands of dollars, actually six figures, um, through cyber theft and, um, whether it be ransom or just, uh, some type of hijacking of a computer system, uh, you know, unfortunately I have seen that, uh, quite a bit recently. Uh, and, and these fraudsters, Mike, they're, they're, they're highly educated that look to infiltrate a PHA's network through unsuspecting employees. Uh, yes. A lot of times it's via email or through a common website. And as you know, you know, most PHAs have computer network security, uh, but that security is only as good as the employees working in that system. Um, so combating cyber fraud needs to be done through extensive employee education, maintaining strict employee password protections. You know, employees cannot be given out their, their passwords. Uh, they cannot be, ha you know, have their password on a sticky underneath their keyboard, um, which is what, what, what we see quite a bit. Yes. Um, and they really, employers need to limit access on work computers to social media and other non-essential work sites or, or non-essential websites. Um, and with regard to, to residents, I mean, it really is unfortunate. Uh, seniors and the poor are tar targets of cyber fraud as much as anybody. Um, and so we've been talking to PHAs about utilizing established tenant association meetings because they, all housing authorities have, have tenant associations. 
And so, you know, we're talking to them about, hey, conducting essential sessions uh, on cyber fraud for PHA residents. You know, we've been a part of that. We've told them to bring their computer software vendors in and, uh, and to, to give sessions on that just to educate um, residents who, who really don't have a lot of experience or just getting experience, you know, with iPhones and laptops and, and computers and letting them know the risks and to, and to stay off websites and to not answering emails. Now, those are all great points. And I like the fact that you emphasized that the IT group could put all that hardware and programming in place to make the system more secure, but it's that stray email, that phishing ex expedition, right? That, you know, really poses the greatest threat or, or at least a pretty significant threat when the unsuspecting uh, employee opens up that email and, you know, now you've got a problem. That's right. That's right. You know, what I like that in something that we do at Neurogratic, as you know, or you just have an ID department run phishing expeditions against your right. existing uh, employees oh. than just, uh, yes, know, it's, uh, it's something that, you know, if you have hundreds and hundreds of employees, you can't inevitably, some employees will be opening them up and then it's like, okay, that employee needs to take a, that's right. And then just keep running that, you know, quarterly or, you know, it's really a function of how, how many. Uh, fish you catch with fish. That's, that's, fish. And that's right. A lot of fish, you need to fish more often. And if you're not catching very many kudos, and then you just have to up, make your fishing a little bit harder to quickly discern. Yep. And that's something that I think is really, uh, you know, it's something that's kind of easy to do. It kind of reminded me when I worked in retail, you know, the department stores would hire shop professional shoppers would come in and you know, pretend to be buying something and then rate you as a salesperson and the type of customer service you have and such. Uh, this is in some ways on that. I don't know if you, yeah, you wanted to say about that topic. It, it's, it is just, it's employee education. It's PHA resident education. As you inform, if you see that phishing email, you're going to recognize it when it really happens. Yes. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I, I remember getting those, uh, getting those phishing emails that we did at Novogratic. And, and, you know, after a while you, you, you really become educated as to what to look for. And so I, I, yep. I think that's a great point, Mike. No, I, uh, I think it's really, uh, and it's, it's easy to do, <laughs> uh, and super effective. So these are all great tips on safeguarding assets. And I, I hope all of our listeners will listen to these and put a large portion of them in place. And that will, you know, minimize the chance for fraud or loss of assets and the rest. But as I also noted, it's no insurance against it happening. And, you know, given the volume of activities and all the rest, you know, fraud does happen, abuse does happen. So maybe you could share with our listeners what you would recommend they do if they discover a fraud. Sure, Mike. Uh, yes, and you are correct. Unfortunately, we have had to perform services uh, in the past for PHA clients that were victims of fraud. Um, you know, we'll perform a couple kind of services. Um, one is called an agreed upon procedure engagement. And this is whereby we would tailor a very specific procedure uh, to identify and quantify the potential fraud, waste, or abuse. Um, you know, this process is the most cost effective for an organization, and it's usually we'll perform this procedure um, when the PHA has identified the area or the department that the fraud has occurred, I, whether it's payroll or procurement, because these services are very cost effective and can be conducted, be conducted rather quickly. Uh, these type of engagements, you know, agreed upon procedures engagements um, are most frequ frequently performed when fraud is suspected. So we'll, we'll do this um, type of thing much more often than fraud audits, which is something we also conduct. Um, fraud audits are usually larger scale engagements that are performed when an organization may feel the potential fraud may be more pervasive throughout the organization. 
Um, a fraud audit may look to reconstruct certain situations and certain transactions to assist in quantify, quantifying the magnitude of the loss. You know, when a housing authority says, I, I know, or an organization says, I know something happened. We really need to get a handle on it. We need to quantify it. We need to bring someone in, recreate these transactions, uh, you know, put the situations back together, start from scratch to figure out where we need to go from here, whether it be, do we need to call, you know, the prosecutor, the ID, IG, do we just need to let the board know? Do we need to just try to recoup the funds from, from an employee or, or whoever the, the fraud may, whoever may have per perpetrated the fraud? No, good, uh, good points and good suggestions. And as I've noted, this is something that applies, not just to public housing authorities, I've done this many times in the course of this podcast, all other types of organizations that suffer these risks. And it's not just inherent to affordable housing, we develop in the rest. It's, it's like they say, you know, why do banks get broad because where the money is. So that's yeah. right. Organizations have, you know, any organization with assets, uh, you know, is at risk of some type of uh, fraud if you have assets and, and or employees. So, you know, and then you mentioned that you have done this yourself beyond public housing authorities and that is a public security practice, but you also work for groups that are public housing authorities. So that would be small if you could describe, you know, situations you may have seen with non-public housing authorities or maybe some more universal takeaways that would uh, apply to all types of entities. Sure, Mike. And, and yes, unfortunately we have had to provide these services for non PHAs, you know, developers, property management companies, certain nonprofit agencies. Um, it's just a part of the business that, that we're in. Uh, you know, we've seen things like, you know, fictitious vendors and, and the washings of checks and things like that. Um, but although there's, there's a lot of, of, um, different scams out there, uh, I would like to, to add though, that an organization's greatest asset in preventing fraud is without a doubt, the organization's own employees. Uh, if a fraud is taking place in an organization, undoubtedly someone else other than the fraudster knows about it, uh, no matter what it is. And uh, most employees at an organization, if encouraged to report instances of fraud, waste, and abuse, uh, will do so uh, if provided a mechanism to do it anonymously and, of course, without the fear of repercussion. Um, you know, this can be achieved through an anonymous tip line monitored by a third party or an internal system that provides for secure written communication. You know, a lot of housing authorities, I've seen little drop boxes where you can put a little message in a box that gets unlocked by a board member or someone independent of the finance process. Um, you know, these systems are, are relatively easy to set up, inexpensive, and very, very effective. Uh, Mike, I, you know, I've also found that organizations, um, and you'd think every organization would, would have this going for them, but organizations that set the proper tone at the top, proper tone with management. You know, that is letting employees know that the organization will not tolerate fraud, that, that we encourage the reporting of fraud and we constantly educate employees on finding fraud and that the, the organizations that do that are the ones least victimized by fraud. That makes uh, total sense. Obviously, tone at the top is important for any organization in so many ways. That's right. So like your uh, point about the tip lines, and there are so many different, different ways in which you can have, uh, anonymous, uh, tip lines or ways in which for tips to be reported anonymously. And as you know, we at Neurobiotic have multiple uh, avenues for that, uh, so that, and then constantly letting employees know about it so that there's a, a vehicle for them in. It's just something that every organization uh, should be having. And, and, what, and once you set it up, the monitoring of it's pretty easy. And it's not that hard to set up. So it seems like that's a, an easy one for every organization to say, yes, we need to do that. I agree. Absolutely, Mike. So Rich, I appreciate you joining me and talking about the four 
you know, key areas of uh, fraud with respect to public housing and other types of uh, agencies. And there's obviously a lot more. This isn't as expansive and exhaustive as we'd like it to be. It's a limited podcast. I know that you were more targeted. So clearly our listeners should know that there's a lot more uh, under the hood and they should feel free to reach out to you. Uh, I ask that you stick around for our off mic section at the end, uh, where I get to ask you some uh, uh, off topic questions. So you can give some advice or recommendations to me and our listeners. And as I uh, was sharing with Rich, this goes out to our listeners. Rich is a valuable resource when it comes to challenges PHAs uh, face, not just with respect to, you know, fraud and protecting assets. He do all the knowledge about all things public housing related, particularly with respect to the Rural Assistance Demonstration Program or RAD. I will include his email address in the show notes for this week's episode, and I encourage you to reach out to him with any questions. And before we get to the off mic section, I did want to look ahead to next week briefly. Next week, we're going to delve into historic tax credits, and we're going to unpack the two types of structures that are generally used, the single tier and the pass-through lease structure. I'll be joined uh, by my partner, John DeJovine. As, as you may know, under the single tier structure, uh, historic tax credit investor invests directly into the entity that owns and renovates the historic property and generates the tax credits. And then on the, under the pass-through lease structure, the developer generally forms an entity own and renovate the historic property, but the tax credit investor invests in a separate entity that leases the property from the ownership entity. And then the historic tax credits are passed through the lease uh, from the entity that owns the property to the entity that's leasing the property. My partner, jo John DeJovine will join me on the podcast and he'll discuss both structures. And I'd say more importantly, he'll discuss the key factors that developers should consider in deciding which of the two structures will optimize the amount of net equity that the developer receives from a store attached credit investor. So now let's turn to our off mic section uh, where I get to ask guests some off topic oh, advice and speak their <laughs> words of wisdom. So no pressure, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> And one thing that I appreciate about Rich is his skill as a public speaker. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I wanted to ask uh, you, Rich, one tip that you have for our listeners to improve their skills as public speakers. Oh, thank you, Mike, for the question. Uh, and thank you for the compliment. I, I do appreciate that. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, public speakers really just need to be comfortable with the subject matter. Uh, when you're comfortable with the subject matter, you come across as relaxed and knowledgeable, and the conversation will usually be fluid and not sound rehearsed or memorized. Uh, uh, you know, we do several uh, conferences every year. I've, I've co-chaired a couple of them, and when I look for speakers, you know, we get resumes all the time. Everybody wants to speak at Novogratic um, conferences, and and I look for truly the expert in the topic we're talking about, because I know that expert will bring value and, and will not have to study and memorize facts about the topic, will, will be uh, fluid and will be relaxed and will bring value to, to our audience. No, that's a great, uh, that's a great tip. I always remember what my father told me one time, uh, he said, uh, it's one thing to know something, uh, and you can know something well enough to pass the exam and, and offer it and such, and to be considered an expert, but to be able to teach it. <laughs> right. That's you right. Have to really know something to be able to yeah. teach. It. So that's a, a, that's a great point. Um, so I wanted to continue with these tips for improvement. <laughs> one of the themes of my questions that I ask or, uh, uh, tips for improvement when I'm not asking about what I should binge watch next. <laughs> uh, so what are some tips that you would have, or at least a tip to stay away from, you know, like the best tip and all the rest. Cause right. then it becomes, okay, well, how are you going to define best and all those sorts of things, but a tip, uh, to help, uh, people improve themselves in their careers. Right. So I didn't phrase that. 
very articulately there. I must not be a very good public speaker. I need to hear it up. <laughs> no, that <laughs> it, it is a it's it, it's a tough, you know, improve themselves and Im, and improve their careers. You know, at Novograd. Yeah, as maybe, a, let me reframe. Let me reframe my question. Uh, give me a lesson that your job uh, has taught you that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life. So with, with my job, um, as you know, we get resumes from some of the brightest, um, students and some of the brightest professionals, uh, across the country. And while I find that so important, uh, the most, what I try to find in somebody when I hire someone from my office is I just try to find good people, you know, listen, they have to be smart. They have to have good experience. But I really try to find good people that take pride in what they do. And, uh, you know, so I'll try to get a sense of who they are as a person, uh, because we are in a service business and it depends, our success depends on delivering great client service. And I have found that those type of people, good quality people that take pride in what they do, um, are the best service providers. And so. Um, that, that's what I look for. That, that is, that is my tip to our listeners. Um, I, I hope that's, that's worth it. <laughs> that is, that has worked for me, uh, in the past. Well, that's a great tip. You've been really successful. So it shows you that that tip really does have impact. Thanks. So let me just say, thank you again, Rich, for joining us. And to our thank you. I'm Michael Novogratik. Thanks for listening. This weekly podcast has been brought to you by Novogratik and Company, LLP. Archived podcasts are available online at www.novaco.com forward slash podcast or by subscribing to the Tax Credit Tuesday podcast in iTunes. You can find related links referenced in this podcast in our show notes at www.novaco.com forward slash podcast. Novogratik & Company LLP is a national certified public accounting and consulting firm with offices nationwide. Learn more about our professional services at www.novaco.com.